Let us pray. Holy God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. May your spirit illuminate our listening and focus our hearts as we hear your word read and proclaim today. Amen. We continue our series in the letter the church calls James. The text is from James chapter 3. Listen for the word of the Lord. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species, but no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and fresh water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Back at the first church I ever worked at, we were in staff meeting one day, and the pastor was excitedly sharing that four people wanted to become new members. Now, this church had been through some tough years, and we hadn't had any new members in a very long time, so this was big news. The trouble was that we couldn't find a Sunday to welcome them into membership because none of the four were going to be in town for church for the next several weeks. And so I decided to remark aloud, well, that bodes well. <laughs> and that was the wrong thing to say in that moment. I remember the air went out of the room and everything fell silent. And later, in that same meeting, the pastoral intern shared that he'd been studying James 3, the text I just read, about taming the tongue, and he felt he needed some special training in this area. And out of nowhere, the pastor excitedly offered him private tongue-taming lessons. <laughs> I'm not making this up. And trying to redeem myself from my earlier gaffe, I said, hey, can I get in on those lessons? Absolutely. <laughs> Group tongue-taming lessons. What fun. And we did all of the things. We read scriptures about listening more than speaking. We prayed against our own tongues. We outdid one another in challenges of silence. It really was something. And it was sincere. And it didn't work because no one can tame the tongue. The writer of our text today envisions the tongue as an instrument of great power. It can't be tamed, but it can be channeled for good use, like a fire. The tongue is like this pilot light that we keep hidden in our mouths, carrying it around with us, and this weary world around us is like a dry forest, ready to be set aflame for good or bad. Words spoken with wisdom and care can light up the world in the best way. But we all know that words used poorly or cruelly can harm and destroy. Ingrid Rasmussen is pastor of Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Minneapolis, and the night after Derek Chauvin killed George Floyd, she got a call from the medic site serving demonstrators. They needed to find a new place to set up because of encroaching fires. 
The church was located in the heart of the growing unrest and had been completely closed for the previous two months because of the pandemic. But because some of the church's congregants were already protesting in the area, the church was able to go from doors locked to doors propped wide open in the span of about 20 minutes. Rasmussen remembers that a few days later, a man approached me carrying a lantern. He introduced himself as Brian Dragonfly from Migazi, a native youth empowerment organization. Their building was located across the alley from the church, and it survived the first night of unrest in the neighborhood, but the next night the fire spread from a neighboring structure. Their building and most of its contents were destroyed. When Dragonfly arrived to assess the situation, the building was still burning. Holding up his lantern, he told me, I decided to capture the fire. He asked, would our church possibly tend this remnant of the fire for Megazi until they could rebuild? He thought that being able to see the destroying flame housed with care would bring some comfort to his community in the weeks and years ahead. Rasmussen writes, in our sanctuary, he set the lantern on the altar. I ran to find a candle. We shared the fire. And along with it, the trauma of the preceding days, the conviction that not all that was lost was to be mourned, and the hope that this ashy moment in our neighborhood's life would be an opportunity for new life somehow. She writes, I decided to bring the flame home each night. I was a little more than fire conscious in those days. So I drove the lit candle home in my car's cup holder. When I made it home that first night, the flame was still flickering. I wept. Friends, there are fires in our world today that burn out of control, some out in nature, set carelessly, others in our cities set deliberately when the words and experiences of oppressed people are scorned and ignored. There are fires raging in our hearts and communities set subtly and destructively as lies and inequity and hostility and hatred shape our lives together. I felt the flames of speech used for harm. No doubt you have too. And they burn. In small, everyday ways and in wider, globe-altering ways, they burn reaching so much further than the impact of the original words themselves, they burn. And the author of our text saw this in their world just as we see it in our world today. And yet I think some good news for us in this text is that God doesn't call us to give up our voices, to quench that pilot light but rather to be formed in Christ over time, in restraint and maturity, following the Spirit's guidance to make good use of the divine gift of expressive language for blessing, for justice, for creating, for dismantling, and recreating all according to the life-giving purposes of God. Jesus said it's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. 
were made in the image of God, after all, who spoke the cosmos into being with the divine word. Out of the abundance of God's heart, all creation sprang forth. Out of the abundance of God's heart, that divine word became human in Christ. Out of the abundance of God's heart, the Holy Spirit rested as tongues of fire over the church, enabling redemptive speech and language not previously possible out of the abundance of God's heart. The church spoke and continues to speak today, even through you and even through me. So I wonder what abounds in your heart today? What longs for expression? What hope? What possibility? What dreaming? What grief do you hold there? What injustice do you burn against? How might you share the divine spark that blazes in you to light up your part of the world? As a younger person, Garrett Mostowski found himself feeling dislocated from the church of his upbringing, and he had a lot to say about it. For Garrett, church seemed more like a social club than a place of healing. Few would address his questions without making him feel lost or heretical. And yet in this season of disillusionment, Garrett decided to spend a summer at a monastic cloister. He remembers his entrance interview. He writes, Sister Scholastica listened intently as I ranted and raved about how I didn't know if I believed anymore or if I even wanted to believe. She said, Brother Garrett, I think you want to believe. We all want to believe. So what chores would you like to do? I emphatically stated that I did not enjoy doing the dishes, and so yard work would suit me best. Sister Scholastica said, good, then you will do the dishes. And Brother Garrett, when you are doing the dishes, listen to God speaking. Find God in the dishes. That's more important than doctrine and theology, which seem to upset you. Garrett writes, a month into washing the dishes and regular monastic life, frustration screamed through my veins as God still seemed eternally absent. I told Sister Scholastica, and she invited me to walk through the forest. She opened with, so how are the dishes? I told her the spiritual dishwashing was not working. I spoke at length before she interrupted, Brother Garrett, you talk so much. Do you listen? When I responded no, she led me to a cramped, dank prayer room. Sit here. Focus on God don't talk. From that point on, Garrett resolved to follow the monastery's vow of silence, which lasted from evening to morning. He hoped to achieve silence most of the day so that when Sister Scholastica again told him to be silent, he could boast of his accomplishments and prove her wrong in every point. But he remembers the silence was not silent at all. Anger swelled in my heart against Sister Scholastica. I hated her for telling me to be quiet. How's the silence? She asked one day. I said it was awful. And she said, what are you learning? I told her that my heart was full of selfishness and arrogance. She said, yes, mine too. I asked her, what should we do about this? And she said, we should continue to listen to God. Follow me. She led me into the cloister's mortuary. Outside the door, she whispered, a sister passed away last night. 
I said I was sorry. Yes, she said. Now, Brother Garrett, go pray for your sisters. I pushed through the door, and there rested the body with two sisters sobbing over it. I sat praying until they asked, would you like to know who she was? For an afternoon, I listened to them, and I prayed for them. By the end of the summer, the dishwashing became tolerable, and I grew accustomed to silence. On our final walk, Sister Scholastica asked, what has God placed on your heart? I updated her. God's teaching me to join the life of the church. God's showing me to appreciate others' views on Christ, to listen to the Bible and not others' views on it. God is granting me peace from my noisy, untamed heart. She smiled, Brother Garrett, you've done very well. Perhaps you'd enjoy doing the dishes twice a day. Friends in Christ, I hope you find God in the dishes. I hope that in our daily rhythms we're responsive to the abundance that God is ever pouring into our hearts, that through our words and our glances, our tones and expressions, God is speaking new life into the world. St. Ignatius of Loyola would often sign off his letters to his Jesuit community with the expression, Ite inflamite omnia, which means go. Set fire to everything. So from each of our corners of the world, may we fan the flames of holy zeal, of divine justice, that a world blazing with the things of God may burn through the mess and back into every heart in abundance. The heavens are telling the glory of God even now. So may we lend our untamable tongues to these crescendos of praise and prayer to our God. May we devote these bodies we've been given to movements of care and of justice as through each expression, in word and in deed, God lights up the world with vibrant life and divine brilliance yet to be known. Amen.